here's a question for you whose approval do you live for each day in your homes neighborhoods and workplaces whose approval do you live for ultimately whose rejection do you fear in your workplace in your homes neighborhoods among your friends when you interact with people whose approval really matters to you that if you do not get their approval would utterly devastate you whose approval do you live for i'm not saying you you don't want to hear your boy, your boss saying well done good job i'm talking about do you live for that approval as if it were a drug and if you do not get that approval what kind of emotions trigger in your thoughts in your minds in your emotions what do you feel because that will tell you whether or not you are actually living for the approval of others and when you do not get their approval and you feel the sting of their rejection how do you live do you think about it does it utterly devastate you and crush you the reason i say this is in our text last week we saw that the word of god came to john the baptist not in the place of political power in in the religious seat of power in chapter 1 in verse 1 sorry but it came to john the baptist out in the wilderness out in the wilderness a place of uh, obscurity a place where you would not immediately get the applause of others all around Israel we saw John was calling people to bear fruit in keeping with repentance and as his preaching gained popularity and the attention of the crowds the Jews began to wonder whether he might be their long awaited Messiah and so in this story we're going to see that John's preaching would eventually not only gain the attention of others but it also result in rejection in his own rejection and eventually his own beheading he was beheaded for preaching the good news and so in our passage we'll see number one expecting the son's arrival number two we'll see facing the world's rejection and thirdly we will see receiving the father's approval expecting the son's arrival facing the world's rejection receiving the father's approval number one expecting the son's arrival 15 as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Christ John answered them all saying I baptize you with water but he who mightier than I is coming the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn and the chaff, the wheat cover, he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, here's a question again what or who do you expect in your life would fulfill the deepest longings of your heart? Everybody in this room, myself included, have a longing in our hearts we have these deep unfulfilled longings as human beings we were made to have these longings but here's what I want to say to you that when those longings and expectations are unfulfilled and we look for them in places and in peoples to give them what only God can give us they result in grief devastating disappointments and even despair Luke says here verse 15 that the people were waiting in expectation they, they were waiting for the Messiah and so as they saw John they began to question in their own hearts concerning who this John is whether he might be the Christ he, or in other places they were wondering is he you know uh, Elijah they were wondering is he a prophet and so here there were questions about concerning the identity of John the Baptist they thought that maybe the long-awaited Messiah had finally come 
For centuries, remember this, the Jews had been expecting their Messiah to come and deliver them from the Roman oppression. This was a very real and difficult situation for them. So as they heard John's preaching, they began to wonder, saying, questioning in their hearts whether he might be the Christ. And see, John's mission was to prepare people for the Lord. He was to prepare the way of the Lord. We saw that in verse 4 last week. His mission was to prepare people, not to bring the attention upon himself, not to gain the applause of the crowd, not to gain credibility among the people, but to point people to the one who is coming after him. He who is mightier than I, the one who is coming, he will baptize you with the Spirit. He's saying there's something much more powerful for which I am preparing you, and it is he who will show that to you. He's saying that in and I want to say this quickly in whatever profession that God has placed you as a believer the call of a Christian is not to make much of ourselves is not to use our positions our titles our achievements and accomplishments to climb the ladder of success so that we can deify ourselves we can make ourselves the hero the centers of the world and the center stage but no it is to point people to Christ whatever position whether it is cleaning toilets all the way to be Coming CEOs, it is for the purpose of being servants of Christ who point people to Jesus, the mightier one, he who is mightier than ourselves. And so this is what John does, isn't it? He says in verse 6, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. Notice how quickly John deflects the attention from himself to the coming one. This is the coming one who was prophesied by Micah, chapter 3, verse 1. He says that Jesus is greater, that he is mightier, that he is worthy of all attention. He says, the straps of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. Remember that in those days, uh, it was the job of servants to untie their master's shoes. Not the disciples, the servants, right? the lowliest of the lowliest, the servants who would untie the master's shoes. And yet John says, he's not worthy to even untie Jesus' sandals. He considers himself unworthy to be the servant of Jesus. See, anything that relates to Jesus when we perceive him rightly for who he is, not to use him to get blessings out of him, but to see him and worship him and see him for who he is, not to get something out of Jesus, but to see him for who he is. Once we rightly see him the way he is worthy to be seen, you start to realize who this person is, that this is no joke, that this is not a cuss word, that this this is a holy God whose sandals John says he's unworthy to untie. He who is mightier, he says. Do you see Jesus as worthy of all glory and honor? Does he gain your attention? Is he captivating in your eyes? See, when our hearts are busy comparing with others, right? You see your co-workers, maybe your neighbors or your friends who got a new car, a new house, a better life that you thought that you wanted and then you start to compare yourselves maybe you compare yourselves with other believers other Christians or non-Christians those who are not Christians and you feel yourself superior somehow you feel yourself more holier than them and it can produce this kind of feel good about ourselves and maybe even look down on them you know and so you start to condescend a little bit even in your words. You're a bit dismissive and contemptuous of their lifestyle, of their clothes, or their, the way they look, or the way they talk. Or, and you start to look down on them. You start to pick on little things that really doesn't matter, right? It can do that to you, isn't it? Human pride is ugly, but John looks to Jesus. When you look at Jesus, in comparison to Jesus, he says, I am not worthy to even untie his shoes. If your heart is busy comparing with Jesus and you, you will never feel proud, you see. 
You will never feel proud and you will be freer because you won't be busy looking at everybody else. You'll be looking at him, the one who is mightier, the one who is lovely, the one who is all worthy of our attention. There is no God like this. John recognizes the worth and holiness of Christ. Remember when, let me go back to uh, Old Testament briefly for you, with you. Remember, you st remember the story of Moses who stood in front of the burning bush in Exodus 3, 9, 3, 5? There was a burning bush. The bush was in flames. It wasn't actually burning. There was flames in the bush. There was fire in the bush. What happened in the fire? What did God say to Moses? God said this in Exodus 3, 5. Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. Take the sandals off your feet. Do not come near. A holy God says, if you come near, my fire will consume you. My holiness will consume you because you're a sinner. Do not come near. Take the sandals off your feet. But here God has come near in the person of Jesus Christ. The God who lives in unapproachable light, who would consume us with his holy presence, has come near. He took on human flesh. He has drawn near. Despite us, our unworthiness, he has come for sinners. John knows he's standing on holy grounds in the presence of Christ. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Moses made flesh standing right before him. The one who is mightier than I is here. John's baptism with water was a baptism of repentance. It was to point Jesus who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. But why fire? He says, verse 17, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. A holy God has drawn near and he is no ordinary God. He has the capacity to judge rightly. What is the winnow winnowing fork? This was a farmer's wooden pitchfork. You know, you know far, you, farmers have pitchfork. It's a farmer's wooden pitchfork used to throw the chaff and the grain into the wind to separate them. Winnowing is a process of separating the grain and the chaff, right? And so what happens? The wheat was gathered in the barn and the chaff was burned in the fire oven, in the oven. See, this is what John is saying. Jesus will come to winnow, to separate believers from unbelievers. He will burn the shaft with unquenchable fire. Again, this idea of hell, I know some modern people find this offensive. I know some Christians who actually, even Christians who think this is regressive, meaning this is outdated, this is primitive idea that this is a myth or something, that somehow we are the advanced, scientifically advanced people, and therefore this is a myth. And therefore, we have a better story to tell. You see the smugness and the pride and the contempt, the blindness, right? But let me tell you that some Christians soften the meaning of the word unquenchable fire. They say, oh, it's not really uh, eternal conscious torment, it's annihilation. Meaning that God will just wipe you out and that's it. You're not going to suffer eternally forever. No. See, John is speaking of the horrors of hell. Unquenchable fire means a fire that cannot be put out. Hell is not annihilation as some put it. Jesus used the same word in Mark 9.43 as Gehenna in the Greek. Hell, the fire which cannot be put out. End of quote. And I wish I had time to walk with you that no one like Jesus preaches hell. He preached hell even more than the prophets throughout the New Testament. Right? He says things like weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of, that's the words of Jesus. Right? In Mark 9 he says that this is Gehenna, the fire which cannot be put out. Or as Revelation 20, 20 verse 10 says, it's a lake of fire. A lake of fire where Satan, the false prophets, and the beasts were thrown into. Paul calls it a place of eternal destruction. Quote, away from the presence of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. Away from the presence of the Lord. So think with me here. Here is how it works. Hell is a place where there is no God. If you don't want God, it, 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 it makes sense that you go to hell. Because you don't want God, so it eventually ends up to that road, you see. 
A place where God retrieves his presence. He can see it, but he's not there. Second Thessalonians 1.9 says, This is away from the presence of the Lord. means away from the God of all grace. Away from the goodness of the Lord. Away from everything that is good and true and beautiful and life-giving. Hell is God's final justice system for those who don't want his presence. It's a place where God leaves them to do what they've always wanted to do, you see. And we see this in Romans 1 where he says, He gave them up to do what they want to do. So if you say, I don't want God, I'm going to live my life the way I want, and that's how I want to live forever. Well, that's where it leads to. And God says, fine, I'll give you what you want. And he leaves you alone. And he leaves you alone, and it's his final justice system for demeaning his glory, demeaning his goodness, belittling his name, and not wanting his holiness and his goodness and his graciousness. And he says, okay, fine. Away from the presence of the Lord. He gave them up in the passions of their flesh, he says, to do what they've always wanted to do. So think of all the ways you want to sin and think of how you will suffer the consequences of that sin and the guilt and the shame that it incurs upon you forever without rescue. And I'm just beginning to talk about the torments, conscious eternal torments. A place of weeping, there will be suffering, there will be misery, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, there will be anger because no one is there to rescue you. So if you want to get far away from God, and God in his infinite justice decides to send you far away from his presence, that's hell. If you want to get away far away from God, do what you've always wanted to do, be the Lord and master of your own life, ruling your own destiny, doing whatever you want to do in the absence of God, God in his infinite justice decides to send you far away from his presence to honor your wish. To honor what you desire. Away from his holiness. That's hell. If your house is about to catch fire. It is a loving thing to sound the alarm. No? If this building is about to catch fire. Isn't it not a loving thing? To tell people. Somebody coming in to the room and say. It's a fire. It's coming. Get out. I was watching the uh, March 11 earthquake tsunami disaster many years ago on video again. Those Japanese people who survived and went to the third roof or to the fourth floor were shouting, Nigeta Kudasai! Nigeta Kudasai! Korenani! They, said. they were calling out to people who weren't listening, some of them, who weren't running and taking it easy. Another survivor said, I, I took it so light when the alarm came. Another person who lost his family says, I want to live and tell people not to take this lightly. If that is what we feel, <laughs> and we know that it's both good and right, John is warning precisely about the winnowing fork that is in his hand, and the one who is the almighty one, the one who is mightier than him, who rules the universe, make himself humble, putting on human flesh, so that he can come and reach us, so that we can reach him now, and saying that he is the one who can take the wheat into his barn, and burn the shaft in the unquenchable fire. This is a holy God who should not be taken lightly. And all sinners are rightly deserving of unquenchable fire. Some people say that's not fair. Sometimes we bring our worldview, our human standards of what is fairness, and say that's not fair. We assume immediately the fair is what we deserve. Human beings assume fairness is what we deserve. In God's economy, it doesn't work that way. With the fall, no one deserves his grace. That is the end, that is the story of grace, is that absolutely nobody deserves his grace. Japan Airlines, Japan Airlines, let's say for example, decides to randomly pick people in this room. Randomly pick people out of their own generosity, out of their own kindness and grace. Randomly pick people in this room to go on a trip to Hawaii. You can't say that's not fair. 
You know why? They don't owe you anything. They decided out of their own goodness to pick randomly people. The ones who are chosen feel like, oh yes, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna respond. <laughs> I didn't earn this. Didn't, didn't earn this. You can't say that's not fair. They don't owe you anything. It's the same with God. A holy God doesn't owe anyone, anybody. From eternity, if you go back to the time of creation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed in perfect unity within the Trinity. They have no need of human beings to fulfill any kind of inner longings. God, to be God, is to be self-sufficient. Not needy like human beings. He didn't create us to fulfill any need in themselves. They, he created us to display His glory. He created us to be in a relationship with Him. And so here, a holy God approaches. And yet, John says He is the mighty one. And He is the one who is able to judge rightly. He is the one who is able to gather the wheat into the barn and burn the shaft in unquenchable fire. That's what John is warning about. Next we see facing the world's rejection. So with many other exhortations, he, reached good, he preached good news to the people. But he wrote the Tetrarch who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that he wrote had done, added this to them all. It's indeed interesting. Sometimes we sin, and when we are confronted, Instead of repenting, we just add more sin to it. Verse 20, he added this to them all that he locked up John in prison. Now many people think if you preach about hell, then people won't listen. Look at John. He just preached hell and his preaching had attracted a large crowd here. And Luke says with many other exhortations, he preached the good news. So what makes the good news good news? What is so good about the good news? See, you must first hear the bad news to appreciate the good news, right? Let me give you an example. So if you go to the doctor and suddenly he tells you the first day you showed up, I have good news for you. You would be puzzled. You would be, if you are in your right mind, you would say, that's strange, doctor, because I've never been examined and I, you must be mistaken. I haven't been diagnosed with anything. What do you mean that you have good news for me? See, to really appreciate the good news, to even know that God loves us, we must know the bad news first. The bad news. The bad news is not what you want to hear, but you need to hear. After the diagnosis comes what you need to hear from the doctor. And what you need to hear from the doctor may not be what you were ready to hear. You might even be devastated initially. But it is a loving thing for the doctor to tell you, what is the bad news? What was the bad news he needed to hear? He wrote needed to hear, but didn't want to hear. Luke says in verse 19 that he wrote that the Tetrarch had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that he wrote had done. But he wrote did not receive this rebuke well. Do you know why? Remember, Herod was the puppet king of the Romans with his brother Philip. We saw that in verse 1 last week. Herod had divorced his wife and married the wife of Philip, his half-brother, Herodias. It was against the law of Moses to marry your brother's wife in Leviticus 20, 21. On top of that, Herodias was his own niece, almost like a half-niece to him. And so Herod was guilty of two things. He was guilty of adultery and incest. And so here, when John confronted his sins, he did not take it well. He did not take it well. John had been preaching, bearing fruits, in keeping with repentance. And now, he, after he confronts Herod, he doesn't take it well. Instead of repenting, verse 20 says, he added this sin to them all, to all of what he had done. It was not, it, as though it was not enough. When he was confronted to cover up his sin, what does he do? He locked up John in prison to silence John because when somebody confronts you, what do you do? You want to get away, far away from them. Some of us just don't have the power like Herod does. If we had the power like Herod, maybe we would throw people into prison as well. As the famous proverb says, if you want to know a man's character, give him power. What does he do with the little power that he has? We just don't have the power like King Herod does. So here he puts him in prison. See, today modern people want to do whatever they want to do without accountability. 
We want the freedom, quote unquote, to a to live according to our sinful desires. We think, if I can do whatever I want, whatever I please, then I will be free. You know there was a lie in the garden of Satan. God is holding back something from you. If you touch the tree and eat of the tree, you will not surely die. Then he contradicts God's word. And that's what temptation is happening every day in your life. Always the temptation always contradicts God's word. But there's half truth injected into half in that half truth, right? Or twisting the truth. See, we want freedom to live according to our sinful desires without God telling us what to do. It's our way of trying to be our own Lord and Savior. What do we do to avoid being corrected in our sins? Do we hide or do we start adding layers of self-justification? So easy. Start looking for someone to blame, like Adam and Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. And so the history of blame shifting has not ended since that very beginning. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. End of quote. I didn't say that. The Hebrew Bible says it. When my wife gently corrects me in the past, I used to get defensive. Which means I have been stupid many times. I have been a stupid husband, a stupid pastor many times. More than I care to remember. What is it about correction that we can't hear that makes it so difficult? Other than to say that the subtle pride in my heart, the desire to justify myself. I know this is not an easy message to hear. John began his ministry around AD 20, uh, 29 and he was in prison the following year. His entire ministry lasted only about three years. One year out of prison, two years in prison. And he was beheaded around AD 32. What will it cost us to tell others about the bad news before they can appreciate the good news? Many followers of Jesus are locked up in prison simply for preaching the good news around the world as we speak. But in Japan, we enjoy religious freedom. Nobody is going to slap me for preaching the gospel. There is no reason to remain silent or remain a coward. The, whole, the worst they might do to you is ghost you in a text message, or find others who lo don't love them enough to say what they really need to hear. Look for preachers who tickle their ears and just tell them nice motivational speeches Sunday after Sunday, and they can't really handle the Bible itself. That is the state of many churches. I say this with sadness, because people are used to listening to surface level, feel good messages that doesn't cut to the heart, and so they remain unchanged. See, And so yet in a culture of group harmony, the fear of man's disapproval is so strong, isn't it? It's sometimes stronger than the fear of God. The fear of man's disapproval is stronger than the fear of God's disapproval. When people look bigger in our eyes than God, we remain in our comforts due to fear of rejection. And many times the reason we fear rejection is because we ourselves idolize our personal comforts. Because to be able to get out there and tell people that they are walking in sin and that they need a savior requires the kind of love that requires us to get out of our comforts. To die to our personal comforts. Even being willing to suffer rejection for the sake of the name of Jesus and saying, right? I prayed for one person one time. It was the first time to pray for him. He's not a believer. And the first thing I said to him, out of love for him, as I prayed with him was, Lord Jesus, convict him of sin. In the end, he shook hands with me. <laughs> he didn't reject me. Sometimes we are afraid, but when the spirit works, it's sweet. The spirit, when the spirit convicts people, it's sweet. It's a sweet conviction. It's not of condemnation, but of conviction. There's a difference. Satan accuses, the spirit convicts. There's a difference. Satan's accusations is harmful. But Spirit's conviction is sweet. So John was beheaded. He suffered the rejection for the sake of the one he was preaching. Because he feared not the disapproval of man, but he feared the disapproval of God. More than he feared the disapproval of man. So how can we be free from the fear of man's rejection? See, John may have been locked up in prison, but his ministry was to point to Jesus, the one mightier than him. The one mightier than him has been unleashed. No matter even if he has been beheaded, Jesus will not fail in his mission. He has come to fulfill his mission. Finally, we see 
receiving the Father's approval. And this is how we can become bold in our witnesses. This is how we can become strong as Christians. Stay with me, 21. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus has also been baptized, and was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now Luke says in verse 12, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, what happened? The heavens opened. <laughs> Why was Jesus, who never sinned, baptized? If John's baptism is for repentance from sins, why was Jesus baptized? Why did Jesus need to be baptized if he's not a sinner? See, Jesus was baptized not because he was a sinner in need of repentance. Jesus was baptized to identify with sinners he came to save. I was seeing this and I thought, what a humble Savior. What a humble and holy God. He came to identify with sinners. He need not be baptized. As a, he's not a sinner, but he came to identify with the sinners he came to save. In Matthew 3.15, when John the Baptist asked him, I'm the one who should be baptized. Lord, why are you asking me to baptize you? And Jesus said, it is to fulfill all righteousness. He came to fulfill all righteousness. So have you been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit today? I want to ask you, because if you are not baptized, maybe you should listen to this. Baptism is a symbol of being united with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a way to publicly tell the world, tell the world, the whole world, that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. It is a public witness, unashamedly saying to the whole world that you have died to sin, in the death of Christ, that when Christ was crucified, that your sins were nailed with him, that when you are buried with Christ, your old self with its lust and desires and all of those things that are grievous to God were buried with him, your old self, and when Christ was raised, you are saying, I'm raised with him to new life, that I have now shared in his life, that this is the new me, that even though I'm not perfect, Inside I am new because Christ made me new to his life, death, burial, and resurrection. So Luke says, when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened. Can you imagine? The heavens were opened like a massive canvas, like a massive curtain in front of all the people there. And notice it says that the heavens were open not before Jesus was baptized, but when Jesus had also been baptized. And verse 22 says that the Holy Spirit came on him in bodily form, visibly, like a dove, and a voice now came from heaven. This is the voice of the Father. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. God is saying, He is my Son. That He is the Anointed One. The Holy Spirit has come. He is the Messiah who is to come. The One who is coming after us, mightier than I, as John says. This Jesus is the only beloved Son with whom the Father is is fully well pleased. Jesus never sinned and obeyed the Father perfectly. Jesus lived the life we could never live. He died the death we should have died. Jesus obeyed his Father to the point of death on a cross to save us. See, the whole Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are right here in verses 22 and 21. Jesus, Holy Spirit, and then the voice of the Father, they are all working together for our salvation. So when we are baptized, this is what happens. Baptism is not just an individual thing. We are an individualistic people. When you are baptized, you are baptized into the community of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the church, when we baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're baptizing them into the community of disciples, you see. 
This is collective and not individualistic, you see? That's why this communal aspect is so important, isn't it? Jesus lived the life we should have lived, died the death we should have died, obeyed the Father to the point of death on a cross. And so, do you see the Father's approval coming before Jesus did his public ministry? This is important. The Father's approval came before Jesus did anything in public. <laughs> I really want you to hear this. The Father's approval came to Jesus before, Jesus before he did anything public. This is significant. God approves you not on the basis of anything you have done. God approves of you not because you are busy serving him. God approves of you because of what Jesus has done. God approves of you not on the basis of anything you have done or will ever do on the basis of what Christ has done on the cross. If this sinks in, your life will be different. When I understood this, my life changed, my heart changed. The way I look at the world changed. No longer needing the approval of others, recognizing that I have the Father's voice of approval, whether I perform well or not. He doesn't say, bad job when I fail. When I fail, he picks me up. <laughs> he puts his arm around me. It's different. The Father's voice of approval comes to you not on the basis of anything you will ever do for God, on the basis of what Christ has done. That is the foundation. And if the foundation is not right, living the Christian life will be very difficult. But here the good news is this. Jesus is the beloved Son in whom the Father is well pleased. Think about, think about the people that you are so disapproving of. Think about the people who disappoints you and, and then in your mind, in your imaginations, you're thinking, oh man, that guy, I really want to punch him in the face. He, you don't say it, but you're thinking it, right? We Christians, we are very good at keeping our mouth shut, but we just don't know how to control our thoughts. We think it. We even entertain thoughts like that. Oh, that guy is so disgusting, but you're smiling at him, you know. And so maybe whatever it is, whoever it is, Think about this. God, when he looks at Jesus, has no thoughts like that. He is fully well pleased with Jesus. No disdaining, contemptuous thoughts on Jesus. Because Jesus fully met the laws of the Father. He fully obeyed the Father. He lived a perfect life. And so, wait a minute before you lose it. God loves his beloved son with perfect love. So when he loves you, listen to this, he loves you in the same way as he loves Jesus. This blew my mind away. It's not new. Theologians have said this for centuries. The Bible has been saying this for years. He loves you in the same way with the perfect love with which he loves Jesus. He is well pleased with you just as he is pleased with Jesus, the beloved son, the perfect son. Oh, that you would believe this. On the cross, this is what happened. God treated Jesus as though he was guilty of all your sins. On the cross, God treated Jesus as though he was guilty of all your sins that you have committed, all that sins you will commit, past, present, and future. That's how effective the cross is. That's how effective his finished work is. It's good for eternity and therefore it covers past, present, and future. All the thoughts that you will be sinning, he covers it. And so what if, if that doesn't move you, I don't know what will pause, reflect, and think about this for a moment, right? On the cross, God treated Jesus who deserved not to be treated wrongly as though Jesus was guilty of all your sins and then he treats you as though you have never sinned. That's why we pray in our prayer of confession. Thank you for clothing us with the righteousness of Christ. Is to say you have the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God who knew no sin, for God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
righteous, counted righteous, charged not guilty because of what Christ has done and because of his righteousness. And therefore, when God looks at you, if you believe in him, not if you don't believe in him, right? If you don't believe, he doesn't apply to you. Unquenchable fire awaits you because you don't want it. You despise the goodness and kindness of God. That's where you will go. But here's the good news. And he treats you as though you have never sinned because of Jesus. Isn't this amazing? Look, the only way to escape the unquenchable fire is to receive the beloved son and receive the father who loves us as he loves the beloved son. On the cross, the father's face turned away because of the ugliness and the horrors of sin. His ultimate disapproval came upon Christ Jesus suffered the Father's displeasure so that you could receive the Father's pleasure that you didn't deserve. Jesus, when he cried, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? We don't want to speculate and blaspheme, but think about it. That dark and lonely moment that Jesus experienced being cut off from the goodness and kindness and love of our Heavenly Father, he took upon himself the sins our fallenness, this is our brokenness, our sufferings. He took upon himself the right judgment that we rightly deserve. We deserve this unquenchable fire, but Christ took it upon himself. He bore the weight of sin when he was cut off. The father turned his face away. The father's disapproval, the father's wrath, the father's ultimate rejection of his son, who knew no sin, lived a perfect life, came upon Jesus, and it was for you. It was for you so that you will not go to the unquenchable fire. Christ took upon himself. He stands between God the Father and you forever. A high priest, when he was raised from the dead, he seated at God's right hand, seated, interceding. He is doing his ministry of intercession, praying for you. When Satan accuses you, he say, no, that is the child of God. No, I purchase him with my blood. He is continuing that ministry of intercession for you. What a savior. So whose voice of disapproval do you fear more than God? As we close, if you live for the approval of others, you might be hurt by their rejection momentarily for a few days, perhaps even years. But if the father rejects you, it'll be eternal. Eternal. If you receive the beloved son, you never have to face the father's rejection with unquenchable fire. Have you been stung by people's disapproving voices in your workplaces, co-workers who snap at you? Maybe you have snapped at people. Maybe you have spoken some disapproving voices. Maybe some people's disapproving voices in relationships have stung you and you remain wounded. Are you carrying deep seated wounds, unhealed wounds, because of what people said to you in the past? Whether they meant it or not, you carry it in. Do you replay those things in your mind? Do they come up when you sleep, when you get up in the morning, when you take a break from work, and you try to get away, you go on a vacation, but it keeps replaying because you take your heart with you wherever you go? Are they there? Do they have so much power over you that you are in despair? Are you in a state of depression where there is no joy coming in? There is no light coming in? Out in a dark place? Do you feel that you are in that situation right now? Because what you need to hear is the light of God breaking in and the Father's voice of approval coming. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Take that personally for yourself. With you, I am well pleased. Not on the basis of your performance, not on the basis of what other people said, not on the basis of what you have ever done, on the basis of what my son has done. I love you as I love my beloved son, who is a blameless son, who was fully well pleasing to me, and I am pleased with you because you have received my beloved son. What do you need to see daily? Is the heavens open like a massive screen? Maybe you need to shut away your screens that are constantly calling you and you are worshipping that thing like it's, it's, it's a God itself. And it's not giving you the ultimate longing and restfulness that your heart is uh, seeking. 
is your heart is perpetually busy because you idolize that thing. It has taken the place of a God. Technology was meant to be human servant, but now it's becoming your, your master, it's dominating you. And that's what happens. When we bow down to created things, they become our gods, and they cannot bring us the fulfillment that our hearts and the rest that our hearts are longing for. Maybe you need to shut that down, go on a fast, and then really ask the Lord to reveal to you how beautiful Jesus is. As the heavens were open and the voice of the Father came, maybe you need to turn, out, turn off all noises, turn up the volume of God's love, right? And then hear what the Father has to say. You are my beloved ch child. Turn that up on full volume. With you I am well pleased because I gave my beloved son for you. There's no voice of approval more rewarding than the Father's voice. This is more rewarding than your boss's approval in the workplace. It is not the voice of condemnation, but of commendation. It is not the voice of damnation, but the voice of forgiveness. It is not the voice of judgment, but the voice of lavish grace. It is not the voice of rejection, but the voice of acceptance. As we wait for Jesus' return, we can now face any rejection that life throws at us because we have the Father's ultimate approval leading on to eternity. So as you go about your day, turn up the volume. Your heavenly father's voice of approval drowns out the fear of man. Go tell others about this great love of Jesus. When we obey God, we are obeying the father who is good and kind and gracious, who already approves of us because of his son. He who is mightier than, our, than us is soon coming again. For those of you who are taking this lightly, if that is you, I pray it is not. Be very, very careful listen to what I have to say to you if you take this lightly and you say that you want to live the life that you want in the absence of God away from God this is the path that it leads to eventually as the scripture portrays us the coming one will not delay as just as John pointed to the coming one we too point people to the one who is coming again very soon John pointed to the one who was coming after him we point to the one who came before us on the cross and he will come again on the last day to judge the living and the dead. Let's stand up and pray.